you're ready, say amen. amen. All right. John chapter 8, verse 12. It says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him. For his hour had not yet come. Let's pray tonight. Lord, as we now study your word, as we dive into your word tonight, we just pray, Spirit of God, illuminate your word. Give us revelation and understanding. Guide us into all truth. God, renew our minds through your word. Lord, come and accomplish your purpose in our life. Sanctify us by your word. Encourage us by your word. Let faith be built up. By your word, God, come and do what you desire to do. Holy Spirit, anoint us. Anoint us today as we study your word together and bless this time. Make it fruitful in our lives and in our church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we continue in our study of the Gospel of John, we are going to be looking at the second of the... I am statements of Jesus. This is the second of those statements. And we know that Jesus is in Jerusalem. And the context that we understand from John chapter 7 is that he is in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. And here in John chapter 8, we had a really an interruption to the narrative where the woman caught in adultery was brought to Jesus... And we saw how Jesus dealt with that situation and how he extended grace to that woman. And now tonight as we pick back up in John chapter 8, we are going to look at this great statement that Jesus makes about himself. He says in John 8 and verse 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Here we see Jesus' declaration. This is that second I am statement. The first one came in John chapter 6 in verse 35 where Jesus made this statement, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And in each of these statements, we see a revelation of Jesus. We see a characteristic of Christ and who he is. We also get a glimpse of the purpose of Jesus and these statements that he makes about himself. And these are very significant statements that we get a glimpse of the glory of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, when he makes these statements, knows full well what he is saying when he says them, says them because he says using this phrase at the beginning of each of them he says I am the light of the world I am the bread which came down from heaven he says I am the door of the sheep I am the good shepherd he says I am the way the truth and the life I am am the true vine. He makes these statements and he always puts the I am in front of them. And this is significant. This is something that we need to understand about these statements. Because the I am that Jesus uses is a clear testament to his divinity. 
It is a clear testament that he is making it obvious that he is God. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses is on the backside of the desert. And Moses, it says, sees a bush that is on fire, but the bush is not consumed. And he approaches that bush, and the Lord speaks to him from that fire and says to him, Take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. And he reveals himself to Moses and he gives a name that had not been known about. God was not known by this name up until this point. There was not a revelation using this statement until this time. You have the term Elohim, you have the term Adonai, you have the term God Almighty, but this phrase that God uses to describe himself in Exodus chapter 3, it is the first statement where this is made. Moses is given a command, go back to the children, go back to the children of Israel, deliver them, go to Pharaoh. But Moses says to the Lord, who do I say sent? Who do I when I go back and I talk to the children of Israel, who do I say that has sent me? What is your name? What is the name that I say? And in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, the Lord speaks to Moses and says this. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. I am. Yahweh is the Hebrew. Yahweh. It was transliterated in your King James Bible to Jehovah. This is the covenant name of God. And in this name, I am, it is a statement of God's eternalness it is a statement of his sufficiency in himself it is a statement that he has always been pure being he is the I am no one else who can say that we cannot say that about ourselves he is the I am he's the ever existing one has a, having no beginning no ending he's the always I am Yahweh the covenant name of God, the name that he revealed to Moses. This name was so sacred to the children of Israel that they would not even say it. They would say the name. They would not say I am or Yahweh. They would say the name because it was such a sacred thing. In fact, the Lord told them, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And they were so scared to use the name of God improperly that they simply said, the name. So this I am is a statement of God's covenant name to the children of Israel. That's why in John chapter 8, just a few verses later when we come to this in our study, when Jesus himself is speaking to the children of Israel, speaking to the Jews, and he says to them, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. And they looked at him and said, you are not yet 50 years old. And you have seen Abraham, and this is what he says. Before Abraham was, I am. And it says in verse 59 of John 8, they picked up stones to stone him because they knew what he was saying. He was saying to them, I am God. I am Yahweh. I am your covenant God. So we see in these I am declarations that Jesus is revealing to us his divinity. And in this particular one, Jesus makes this statement to the Jewish people 
In the court uh, or in the treasury, it says in verse 20, which was also the court of the women. And he says to them, I am the light of the world. Jesus is in the treasury, the court of the women. And we know from our time of study, knowing that the context is right around the Feast of Tabernacles. And at the Feast of Tabernacles, there were two ceremonies that were performed during this feast. The first one was in the morning, they would lead a procession out to the pool of Siloam and they would draw water from that pool and they would quote Isaiah 12 and then they would bring it back and they would pour out that water beside the altar and it was a remembrance of God providing for them in the wilderness, giving that water for them from the rock. It was a remembrance of God providing rain for their crops in sea. Season and for the harvest, and it's in that that setting in John chapter 7 and verse 37 that Jesus stands up and says, He who is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Right? Here in John 8 and verse 12, there was another ceremony that they did in the treasury, the court of the women. There was a custom at night during the Feast of Tabernacles where they would light massive chandeliers and they would raise them up in that court and it was said that it was so bright that it would illuminate much of Jerusalem and this was a ceremony to remind them of God leading them through the wilderness. God led the children of Israel in the wilderness with a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. And that pillar of fire went before the children of Israel and it lit their path. It directed them through that wilderness that they were traveling on. Jesus, in this context, stands up. And he says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And this is something that the Apostle John uses frequently to speak of Jesus. Speaking of Christ being the light. In fact, let's turn to John chapter 1. Let's go back to the very introduction of this book where it says this about Jesus. It says in verse 5, And the light, speaking of Christ, shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it or did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Jesus is the true light. Jesus is the one that gives light to every man coming in the world. Jesus describes himself in John chapter 3 after he says the most beautiful verse in all of sacred scripture, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And then Jesus says in verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And look at what verse 19 says. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. He is the light that came into the world. He is the one that came into this world to bring light to those who are in darkness. We see also the statement made in the Old Testament about God being light. There's several verses. And there's a bunch in the book of Isaiah that we're going to look at real quick. But there's a handful in the book of Psalm. In fact, turn with me to Psalm 27. Psalms 27.
Psalms 27 at verse 1. Here's what it says. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 36 in verse 9 it says, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. In your light we see light. The word of God is described in Psalm 119 in verse 105 that the word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Jesus is the word made flesh, amen. He is the, in the beginning was the word and the word of God, it says, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Then you come to the book of Isaiah and the book of Isaiah prophesies about Christ in detail. And it says this in Isaiah chapter 9, that great chapter where we read about that son given. We preach about it almost around Christmas. We quote that verse, for unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born, or a child is born and a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. But at the beginning of that chapter, it makes this statement about the Messiah and it says in verse 1, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her. By the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. And who is that light? Who is the prophet Isaiah referring to? That the Galilee of the Gentiles, who was the one who did the majority of his ministry in Galilee? It was Jesus. He is that light that was prophesied. In Isaiah chapter 42, it says about Jesus being the light. It says in verse 5 in Isaiah 42... Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Who's that talking about? Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the light of the world. Isaiah 49 and verse 6. One more verse it says, Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of of the earth. Amen. Jesus. Isaiah chapter 60. It says this. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. He is the light of of the world. He is salvation. He is deliverance. As one person said, to a sin-cursed world, he is the light of salvation. To the darkness of falsehood, he is the light of truth. To the darkness of ignorance, he is the light of wisdom. To the darkness of sorrow, he is the light of joy. To the darkness of sin, he is the light of holiness. To the darkness of death, he is the light of life. He is the light of the world. He is the Savior. Jesus stands up and makes this statement, I am the light of the world. And then he says, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. 
He who follows me. To follow him is to believe in him. To follow him is to be his disciple. To follow him is to be one of his people that have been born again. That's what it is to follow him. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. If you are his disciple, you will not walk in darkness. If you belong to him, you will not be in darkness. 1 John chapter 1. Turn with me there. 1 John, not John, 1 John. This is the message, verse 5, which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all Sin. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness. To be in darkness, this is a spiritual term. To be in darkness, this is what it's talking about. It's speaking in many different ways, but one way is to be in darkness is to be in ignorance. When you say somebody's in the dark about something. It speaks of ignorance. That's what it is to be in darkness. But it is also a moral statement that if you are in sin, if you are dead in sin, you belong to the darkness. You are a part of the kingdom of darkness. You are in darkness. If you are in sin, if you are apart from Christ, darkness is where you dwell. And Jesus says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We are to walk in the light. If we follow him, we will be in the light. I love how it describes this in Ephesians chapter 5. Turn with me there. Ephesians chapter 5. Paul tells us how to walk, how to live our life as Christians. And then he gives a little biography about us, all of us, before we came to Christ. He says in Ephesians 5 and verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Right? We're no longer to have fellowship with the unfruitful kingdom of darkness that we were delivered out of. We're no longer to have that communion, that intimacy with that darkness anymore. We were once darkness, but now we are light in the Lord. We are to walk as children of the light. And Jesus said, he who follows me will not walk in darkness. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it speaks about the coming of the Lord. And how many realize that the coming of the Lord will come upon people surprisingly. Right? As a thief. Which is interesting because it speaks of the suddenness and the unexpectedness of it. It says, and this is after that great statement in chapter 4 about the Lord descending from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, 
How many understand that there, are, there were not chapters and verses when, these, when the Bible was written? You know that, right? Those were added thousands of years later. The, the chapters and verses, these were actual just one continual letter. And sometimes the thought is broken up by the division of the chapter. But this flows right from chapter 4. It says in verse 1 of chapter 5, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Here's what it says in verse 4, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. We are not in the darkness. We are sons and daughters of the light. We are walking in the light. We are in Christ. We've been brought out of darkness. And this is what it says. This is exactly what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, if you want to turn with me there. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may, may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We follow Jesus in the light and we will not walk in darkness. The description that is given of the world, that is given of us, before we came to Christ, is that we were in darkness. The world right now is in darkness. The world right now is in darkness. They're blind, just like we all were, dead in sin, dead in trespasses. That's how we all were. That's the description that is given. They were in moral darkness, spiritual darkness, ignorant of God... They, we walked in according to our sinful nature. We were in bondage to sin, right? Jesus will say in John chapter 8, He who sins is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever. That's who we all were at one time. We were slaves of sin. We were in darkness. We were in chains of darkness, and we belonged to the kingdom of the prince of the power of the air. We all did. Salvation is not just a turning over a new leaf. It is a supernatural God event in the life of an individual. You literally pass from death to life. You literally become a new creation in Christ. You literally are brought out of darkness into his marvelous light. These are not superfluous things. These are not exaggerations. This is what happens when a man gets saved. Amen? You were a slave, you become a son. You were in darkness, now you're a child of light. That's what happens. Right? Praise God. Salvation is the greatest gift that we have experienced. You see, we all at one time were in Satan's kingdom. And right now, if you're unregenerate, if you're not born again, you're in Satan's kingdom. There is no neutrality. You don't walk in a neutral way on this path of life. You are either in his Satan's kingdom or in God's kingdom. We got to understand that. There's no neutrality when it comes to this. There is no, there are some people this way. No, no, no. That's why it's described when Jesus describes hell. He describes it as outer darkness. It's the complete end of your rejection of God. You go into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. He gives you over to your heart's desire. 
That's what hell is. No one goes to hell undeserved. My goodness, you've got, we've got to get that out of our own, own thinking and understanding. We don't understand the holiness of God and the justice and mercy of God and the love of God displayed on the cross. If you sin against an infinitely holy God, the punishment is an infinitely holy punishment. Right? I've, I've spoken of this before. But if you offend me or you smack me, you're, nothing's going to happen to you. I mean, Brother Thompson might shoot you. Brandon might. Just kidding. None of those guys would do that. I hope not. That would be very bad pubis, pu, uh, news for the church, wouldn't it? Pastor gets smacked, elder shoots a guy. Not what you want to hear on Channel 9. But nothing's going to happen to you. You smack a police officer, what's going to happen? If you smack a police officer, right? You're going to be thrown in prison. You may get out after a few days. You smack the president, you probably will get killed by secret service. Because the punishment is in accordance with the greatness of the individual. Right? The punishment is in accordance with the greatness of the individual. And God is infinitely great. You and I have got to get a bigger view of God or we won't understand hell. And hell is described as, as outer darkness, right? It's the giving over of what men want. Romans 1 says their foolish hearts were darkened. And we all at one time walked in darkness. We read in 2 Corinthians, turn with me there, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul describes why is it that some people don't see the glory of the gospel. He says in verse 1, we'll just read from verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And here's what he says. But even if our gospel is veiled... It is veiled to those who are perishing. Like they can't see it. They're blind. And here's why. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. And here's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. For it is God who commanded light to shine in the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I love this. He uses speaking in the very beginning. It was dark. It's amazing. You go back to Genesis 1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, right? And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said in verse 3, let there be light, right? And light, this was before the sun, right? This was before any 
uh, created light. This was just light came into existence, right? And here the Apostle Paul uses the analogy of our salvation like God commanding the light to shine in our darkened heart, right? To, to reveal the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, right? The light that shines in us is revealed in the face of Jesus. It's Jesus now. Amen? That's what happens when we get saved. That's why you and I can see the glory the light has been revealed to us. We can see Christ. He's not veiled to us. The veil's been removed. Right? When we read about Christ, when we hear about Christ, when we sing about Christ, there's a knowing there. There's a love there. Because God has caused the light to shine in the darkness of our hearts when you believed on Jesus. And the veil is gone, right? And one of these days, we're going to see him fully, face to face, right? We will behold him. We will see him, and it won't be in a mirror dimly. And it won't be in a mirror dimly. It won't be in shadows and types. And it won't be by faith anymore. It will be with sight. We will see him. You see, Jesus is the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. Paul describes our salvation in Colossians 1, verse 13. He has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness, from the domain of darkness... This analogy, like God went into the kingdom of darkness, grabbed you out and brought you out into the kingdom of light. That's what happened when you and I got saved. Now we are children of the light. We do not walk in darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. When we believe upon him, when we trust in him, when we turn to him, when we place our faith in him, we will not walk in darkness, but we have the light of life. And this is what he says to this crowd in Jerusalem. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And let's look at verse 13, their reaction. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Look at their response. Typical. Right? They get more hostile as we read the Gospel of John. But I believe this is a reference to what we read in John chapter 5. Jesus said in John chapter 5 and verse 31, here's what Jesus said. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Jesus is speaking in that context after he healed that man, after he healed that man at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath day, and they want to kill him, right? He's having this interaction with them. And here it seems as if they're mocking him, saying, Hey, you told us if you bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. And so they come at him, Hey, you're bearing witness of yourself, right? Your testimony isn't Valid, they are accusing him of being false. You see, within the law of God, and they're using the law of God to establish guilt or innocence, or actually guilt, there had to be two witnesses. That's why at the trial of Jesus, they had to scrounge up. They tried all they could to get two witnesses, right? At that tragedy of a trial... 
to validate their testimony. But if you remember our study in John chapter 5, Jesus' testimony wasn't alone. He, we had the testimony of the Father, the testimony of John the Baptist, the testimony of his own works, and the testimony of the law of Moses, all bearing witness to Jesus. And Jesus in verse 14 answers their accusation of him being false, and here's what he says. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from, and I know where I am going, but you do not know where I came, come from and where I am going. And this statement that Jesus makes, defending himself, he says, Even if I do bear witness of myself, my witness is true. Why? Because I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. You know what he's saying there? That he's the eternal God. He's the word made flesh. He knows that he came from heaven to the earth. Listen, Jesus did not come into existence when he was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He did not come into being there. He took on flesh there. He became fully man or truly man there. But he is the everlasting second person of the Trinity. Always has been. And so when he says, even if I do bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and I know where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from. You do not know where I am going. He says to them in verse 15, You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. He's speaking to these people, these Pharisees. They can only judge in a carnal, fleshly, earthly way. Right? You remember when they wanted to kill him? For healing that man who had been crippled for 40 years, laying in that pool, by that pool, they cared more over the fact that he broke one of their man-made laws. That's the type of judgment that these men had. Right? You judge according to the flesh. And when he makes this statement, I judge no one. It could be referring to, I judge no one according to the flesh that way. But I believe he's referring to the fact that when he first came, church, he did not come to judge, did he? He did not come to condemn. Why did he come the first time? To save, to redeem, to reconcile, to forgive, to give eternal life. That's why he came. When he comes again, all judgment's committed unto him. Right? As David said in Psalm 2, Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. There will come a day when he is coming with eyes like a fire, right? On a white horse with a vesture dipped in blood, right? Many crowns on his head and he comes to wage war and to conquer. But that's not how he came the first time. He did not come to judge. He says in verse 16, And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not, not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. Here we see the absolute unity that he has with the Father. As we go back, turn, turn back with me real quick to John chapter 5. Jesus never did a solitary thing outside of the will of the Father. Not one time. Not one time did he operate in autonomy outside of submission to God the Father. Everything that Jesus did, he did in unity with God the Father, 
carrying out the will of the Father perfectly. Every miracle, everything that he taught, every deed that he did was in accordance with the will of the Father. And so here when they accuse him, he is saying to them, even if I do judge, I judge because I am at one with the Father. My judgment is righteous. You remember Jesus said in verse 17 after he healed that man at the pool of Bethesda, my father has been working until now and I have been working. You see, God the Father never takes a day off. God doesn't take a day off. Yes, I know on the seventh day he rested as an example to us. But he never takes a day off. He always upholds all things by the word of his power. He's always causing the sun to rise. He's always causing the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. And when Jesus says, my father has been working and I have been working, he's saying, I'm God. Right? I'm God. Verse 18, therefore the Jews sought to kill him because kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And here's where we read verse 19. Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do for whatever he does, the son does also in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. All that Jesus did was in unity with the Father perfectly. And when he says in verse 16, For I am not alone, for I am with the Father who sent me. Verse 17, It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. This goes back to the law of Moses, that guilt could not be established with just one witness. There had to be two Verse 18, Jesus said, I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. The Father bears witness. We see the Father speaking from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We see the Father at work in his ministry, bearing testimony to him. In John chapter 12, he speaks again on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. He speaks from that mountain. This is my beloved son. Hear him. The father bore testimony. And the greatest validation and the greatest testimony that Jesus was who he says he was and operated according to the will of the Father is that after three days he rose again from the dead. Had he been outside of the will of the Father, he would have remained dead. Right? Verse 19, Then they said to him, Where is your father? Some believe this is an attempted assault or insult to Jesus. Because they've already accused him. They're going to accuse him here shortly of being illegitimate. Of being an illegitimate child. Where's your father? Where's Joseph at? Could you imagine the controversy surrounding somebody that says they were they conceived a child without having intercourse. Right? That is an amazing, but that's what happened. And in the natural, if you heard that, right? So he was con conceived, or it says, they, they said of him later in John chapter 9, you were conceived in fornication. Think of the insult. Where is your father? Jesus said to them, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. It makes it clear to them. Just like he said in John chapter 5. If you had known me, 
you would know the Father. If you had known me, if you knew God, you would know that I have come from God. That is perhaps the most condemning statement that Jesus could make. He's saying to them, you don't know God. They weren't in right relation to God. I'm going to make this statement to us again. Jesus Christ is the only way to come to the Father. No one comes to God another way. No one. No one. There, listen, there's not a Jewish way of salvation apart from Jesus. There's not a Muslim way of salvation. There's not a Hindu. There's not... There's only one way. And if you do not have Jesus, you do not know God. That is an absolute statement to make. That is a statement that causes division. That is a statement that makes a line in the sand, but it's true. Jesus said in John chapter 10... John chapter 10 and verse 7. Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear of them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I am the door. He is the door. Right? He is the way in which you must walk through in order to find pasture. You have to pass through Jesus. Right? That's using that analogy. Shepherds used to lead their sheep into a pen. And what they would do, they would literally stretch their body across the opening of the pathway. They would literally stretch their body across it. Jesus makes the statement, I am the door. You have to come through me to enter in here, to enter into pasture to enter in. He says in verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Look at what verse 30 says. I and my Father are one. Man. No wonder, verse 31, it says, what did the Jews do? They took up stones. Right? Jesus is the only way to God. He is the light of the world. We'll close with verse 20. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. No one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. He's in that treasury, the place of the offering. It's also called the court of the women. There's 13 different places to give, it was said. 13 different chauffeurs that were the funnel for the money. It's in this very court, this very place where Jesus will see the woman put two mites in, into the treasury. He sees all the wealthy putting in. It's in this place where the Sanhedrin convened just right off the side where they would be in earshot of him teaching if they were there. It's in this place where they lit the lamps, where he declares, I am the light of the world. And here we see no one laid a hand on him. And we're reminded one last time that he was in control. Right? 
No one takes my life from me. I lay it down. How many legions did he have at his command at any moment, he said? Right? How many legions of angels could have came in one moment? He was in full control. No one laid a hand on him. And as we close tonight, remember, let's remember, Jesus is the light of the world. He's the light of the world. He is our salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. My God in whom I trust. The Lord. He is the light of the world. Amen. Jesus. Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the revelation of yourself. And Lord, touch our hearts. Let that light shine more and more into our hearts. Let the glory of God be revealed more and more in the face of Jesus Christ to our hearts, God. Help us to walk as children of the light. Help us to walk in the light as you are in the light. Help us, God, tonight. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you came to save us, that you came to redeem, that you came to the darkness of this world to rescue those who were perishing. Thank you, Lord, that you called us. You are the good shepherd and you called us. You left the 99 and you came seeking us, after us, God. Thank you for that, Lord. God, we love you tonight. We worship you. Lord, I pray that the word of God that we have studied, that we have looked at, would find good soil in our hearts, that it would bear fruit 30, 60, 90, and 100 fold in our life, God, and that we would grow because of all that we've studied. Apply it to our hearts, we pray tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.